Um, hi, everyone. I'm Emily Anderson, the founder of Mom Crew. Thanks so much for joining today. Um, I founded Mom Crew in 2019 when I lived in New York, um, and the goal of it was to provide opportunities for expectant and new moms to connect with one another. So I run um, Facebook communities in different cities. Um, it was only New York, um, but since I have since moved to LA during the pandemic, um, it's now in multiple cities. Um, and uh, I also um, we used to host in-person new mom happy hours and mom-to-be meetups, which were a lot of fun. But since the pandemic hit, um, all the events have been virtual. Um, and I focus a little more on um, partnering with specialists to offer educational events for moms and moms-to-be, um, which has been fantastic. Um, Vivi um, is a wonderful organization that I partner with a lot. They have um, such a wealth of knowledge themselves um, as one of the top child care providers um, in Manhattan and now offering at home care around the country. Um, they also partner with a lot of great specialists themselves to be able to bring helpful information to moms. So um, today's topic I know is a very hot one on pretty much every mom's mind, sleep. Um, even those of us who, you know, sleep trained and have really focused on this from the start, there's always ups and downs. There's always things that come up. There's always like unexpected, you know, everything was going well. And now suddenly, like, you know, this is happening. Um, so, you know, I know I have a two-year-old and a five-year-old and, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to all the new tips that will be shared with me today. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Gretchen um, from Vivi. She will give a little intro. She'll introduce Jensine. Um, Jensine will go ahead and, uh, uh oh, now I can't see you anymore to be able to spotlight. Oh, you, no, Gretchen. sorry. It's okay. Do you want me to stop um, sharing? <laughs> yeah, just for a sec. <laughs> I got so excited. <laughs> I know. No, it is exciting. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, as as um, Jensine is going through her material, feel free to just write your questions in the chat and we will have time for them at the end. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it right over to Gretchen and we will get started. Okay, now cue to share. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, we love you and we love what you do at Mom Crew. And um, I feel like you know Vivi so well. You you gave us such a wonderful introduction. Um, just to reiterate, I'm Gretchen Richer. I'm the director of family experience at Vivi, and we are on a mission to reinvent childcare and early learning for today's families. I see some Vivi families up on the screen and I see some names. So it's so nice to see um, some current families. Um, we are on campus. Uh, in New York City for ages six weeks to five, to five years. And then nationally, our in-home program, as Emily said, takes everything about the school model and places it inside your homes. And um, a fun note here, we're so grateful to our friends at Lewis for partnering with us to give away their blowfish sleeper and radish pout set to one lucky parent. Um, if you saw us on Instagram this week, we're giving a quick giveaway. They make really cute pajamas and crib sheets. So check them out at, at Lewis Home on Instagram and stick around to find out if you're the winner. And yes, this topic of sleep, um, I am especially excited mostly because I'm jacked up on caffeine because my son and I got up at 4.30 today. So I'm going to be sucking in a lot of information. Um, we are all shaking our heads. We're talking about common sleep problems, as many of you noted in the comments. It's a challenge that shows up in many different ways across all of the ages of early childhood um, for all families out there. So maybe you're experiencing challenges with your infant child, or maybe that stage was a breeze and now the toddler and preschool years are really giving you pain. Or maybe you're like me and every step was met with a little bit of a battle. Uh, I've got some scars along the way too. So um, I know we won't get into um, just everything in these 45 minutes uh, since every child is unique and every family is unique. But what I hope you can walk away is with one practical, applicable tool that will help your family with better sleep routine, even if it's just a small, simple phrase or gesture or way of thinking that you can do better to adjust. Uh, and who better to do that than our speaker, uh, Jenzine Rich, a sleep expert and facilitator with The Loved Child. Um, we work really closely with The Loved Child or TLC. They offer online classes, workshops, and one-on-one -on -one sessions, and they truly work as a community committed to the well-being of all children um, and the adults who care for them. So anything from prenatal all the way up to corporate family wellness, um, they are like-minded, like mom crew and like Vivi, and we are so excited to have Jen Zine Rich here to teach us the way <laughs> or guide us, guide us back to sleep, please. Um, Jen Zine, <laughs> can you just give us a little bit of info about who you are and what you do? And then we'll turn it over to you. 
Sure. Um, so yes, I'm Jensine. I am mom of three, first and foremost. So I am in every stage. I have a three-month-old, a two-year-old, and a four-year-old. So I have like the newborn things going on. I have the two-year-old in a crib, and then I have the four-year-old in a bed. So whatever stage you're in, I I am there with you, <laughs> probably. Um, so I used to do early intervention. I did in homes with children, um, loved it. Once I wanted to come home with my boys, when I just had my boys then, um, I knew I wanted to continue to help families, but I wanted to be um, home with them a little bit more. So enter the consulting. I absolutely love what I do. I love helping families get more sleep because sleep is one of those things. You can't skip over it. You can't put it off for another day. You can't just kind of let it go and hope it gets better um, because oftentimes it may, but then it will change. So I'm so excited to be here and help all of you with some very tangible tips to start to implement tonight that can help you all get more sleep. Awesome. So tell us um, what we are going to be talking about today. Yes. So today we're going to talk about the three most common sleep issues that children um, have. So it's going to be very broad because I saw there was someone with a four month old, there was like three and five year olds. So these are going to apply across all ages. It's just a little bit different how it applies to every age group. So um, first, we're going to start talking about like the foundation. So you have a really good background of what do you even have in their room, what it should look like for them to be able to fall asleep. And then what are some of those issues of getting to sleep, staying asleep, and then what's waking them up if there's nightmares or night terrors before we get into the questions. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so a lot of times I will hear families that tell me like my baby was just born a terrible sleeper. Like there's nothing I can do. They're just a terrible sleeper. Um, and that's not, that could be true, but there doesn't mean that there isn't something you can do about it. Um, some babies are like those textbook babies, I call them. They are born, they sleep through the night at three weeks old and they never turn back. And they're, it's just amazing. Um, wonderful for those parents if there's any of those in here but then there's a lot of children that are not born natural sleepers and that's okay there's nothing that you did wrong that your child did wrong anything like that it's just kind of like the luck of the draw um but that doesn't mean if your child had a little bit of a speech delay you would go to a speech and language pathologist and help them catch up if your child had a gross motor delay you would go to a pt help them along they would get the skills they'd be good to go Sleep is very similar to that, where it does feel so personal um, when your child is not sleeping, but it, it really is just one of those things um, that maybe your child needs a little bit of boost to help them figure out. And then once they get it, they're good to go and everyone is sleeping well. So definitely, the, if you don't hear anything else that I say today, just know that sleep is not personal. It is not a reflection of you or your child or your parenting or anything like that. It just kind of is one of those things. Um, so creating a sleep environment, this is going to be a really big deal because you want to make sure that the place that your child is going to be sleep sleeping is optimized for their sleep. Where if you're putting them in a super bright room, that's noisy, that's loud, that's fun, they're not gonna wanna sleep. <laughs> so um, sound machines, that's one of my biggest things. We, between three children, we have like six sound machines. So I'm a huge fan of them. Um, you want to strategically place them in the space that the noise could be coming from. So we have really creaky stairs. I have a sound machine outside of my children's room to um, help block out some of that sound. Um, Ideal temperature, you want to be between 68 and 72 degrees in their room. If you have a monitor that tells you the temperature, perfect. Um, if not, you should just be able to, if you can set it, that's great. Um, but adjust their, like what they're wearing, depending on what your heat or cool situation may be. Maybe you like it a lot cooler, um, but you notice that your child, their chest is um, cold then you're gonna to wanna to dress them a little bit warmer. Um, I saw someone come in, how accurate are the monitors? Eh. It depends because if you have the monitor right next to like a heat source, then it's gonna say that it's a lot warmer in there than what the rest of the room might be reflecting. So that's a little bit tricky. You can go like, you can place the camera in a central place or someplace that's not like right near a vent 
then you would be able to get a better reading. Um, for children under two, you want that room as dark as you can possibly get it. Looking at this darkness scale, you want it to be an eight or above. That can be really hard to achieve with just blackout curtains. So I always recommend a blackout shades or blackout blinds because with the curtains, you're still gonna have the space in the middle, the sides and the top that are not gonna be covered. So the blinds are gonna cover that full window. Um, I say children under two, it should be as dark as possible because they're not yet showing signs of being scared of the dark. Um, but children over two, then you can have a night light or something like that to kind of help when they are um, expressing some fear around things that they may see in their room. Once that imagination kicks in, then they could want um, a light just to help them feel a little bit more comfortable. And you're talking about nighttime, obviously, because we're talking about being in the dark. Um, are you, and I say this knowing that so many of our families um, have group childcare, so they are sleeping possibly in a place where they can't, um, they don't have control over the lighting for naps, but would you also recommend the same thing for naps? I would, yep. The way that it looks at midnight, you want to look at noon. Um, in a group childcare situation, it's kind of like control what you can control. I wouldn't worry too much about it because there's gonna be so many other factors of other children, teachers walking around, um, those kinds of things. So you want to, like, the, I'm sure the classrooms are doing what they can, you know, to optimize that sleep, but I wouldn't worry about it um, too much. Awesome, thank you. And my computer is, there we go, number one. Um, so yes, the first one is getting to sleep. So I saw some, as people were introducing themselves, the bedtimes were a little bit tricky. Um, and that could really range from like the day, you have a one day old or a five year old, bedtimes could be tricky. Um, so the very first thing to note is that overtired children go into a hyperactive state. So oftentimes I'll have parents tell me that they're gonna do a later bedtime because they think it'll help them fall asleep a little bit easier. Um, but that's actually the opposite. So once your, bo your body will go into kind of a fight or flight, if their body is telling them I'm tired, but for some reason, something is keeping them awake, they're then going to go into that fight stage and feel like there's danger around and cortisol levels are going to rise. So they're going to actively keep themselves from falling asleep. So there's like a little magic window in there where you want to, they're naturally starting to fall asleep. You want to get them into bed at that time before they hit that hyperactive, where if they hit that stage, you're going to have to wait until that like period has kind of passed to get them to sleep. So really just kind of watching your child and their cues and noticing, okay, they're starting to get tired. We need to get this bedtime routine rolling so that they don't hit that kind of second wind and are um, too active and too hyper to be able to fall to sleep easily. Um, having a nice, relaxing and predictable routine will really help them unwind. None of you, I'm assuming, just when you decide to go to bed, you don't just like stand up, walk to your bed and lay down. You have a little routine that you well, do. Well, we all do because we're exhausted, but yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> <Right. laughs> That's the case, but you just fall face first into the bed. But usually you would like go to the bathroom, brush your teeth, change into pajamas, make sure the door is locked, get a sip of water, you know, whatever it may be. But you probably have a very like predictable routine that you do before you go to bed. Same thing for your child. If they're playing happily and you just like pick them up and plop them into their bed, they're gonna be like, okay, well, what is happening? There's no wind down time. So you need to have that predictable routine so they understand when these things happen, it means that sleep is coming and expected. So you want that routine basically across the ages, things are going to be pretty similar. Three months and younger, you don't, this doesn't really apply, um, but you're gonna start with hygiene. So if they're taking a bath, a bath is such a significantly different experience from anything else they're doing during the day. So it's really helpful to start with the bath um, because that's a, like a very big signal, of, like changes coming, things are different. If you don't do a bath every night, that's fine. I have three kids, I do not bathe them every night. Um, so if you are gonna do it, that's when I would do it just to kick off that bedtime routine. But if not, then you're going to the bathroom still, you're doing that teeth brushing, maybe they're washing their hands and face, things like that. Once they come into their room, that is it. They're then in their room until morning because we wanna limit those transitions of, 
you're going from bath to the bathroom to your bedroom, back to the bathroom, back to the living room, now you're to your bedroom. That is a lot of opportunities to get distracted, to try to stall, to just run away. So you want to make the routine as streamlined as you possibly can. So after they're in their room, if they're under 12 months, you would include a feed, um, maybe some books, songs, something to help them continue to wind down before you place them into your bed. The routine should not include screens or any really large motor movements because again, getting like running, jumping, a lot of those really active activities, sometimes children have a really hard time winding down from those. They're gonna still be going up and up and up and you want them to be coming down. I wouldn't include screens at least one hour before bedtime. Um, and for older children, you might find yoga or meditations helpful, things like uh, Relax Kids is a website that's a really great resource. They have these yoga cards that you can print out. Um, it, depending, I would say like a four or five year old, maybe even a, an advanced three year old. Um, but you can pick a, they can pick a card every night and you can do that yoga pose to help them just center and start to wind down from the day. Um, Venimal is a little, um, it's a little turtle that they have these cards, these meditation cards, and you can play them during the bedtime routine. And it will walk them through a story of just, you know, how to relax and calm and center. And that's really helpful for some of those kids that might hit that hyperactive state um, that are a little bit older because it's really hard to just lay in the dark in silence for a lot of people. Um, so this just helps them have something to listen to while they're relaxing and, and unwinding. So really having your child fall asleep independently will help your overnight. I have I have a couple of questions um, and Emily, I don't, okay, you were not asking. Uh, a couple of questions that kind of came out of some of the questions our, our audience had been asking. Um, one, what about like the pushback, like the one more drink, the one more, one more of this, one more of that. I, I know you you do something with your kids that is a helpful tool. Um, can you share like the pushback uh, yes. of dragging it out, right? Yes, so we'll do something called last sip um, and you could really apply this to anything. So we, um, my oldest son, I started to notice he would always like, he would be perfectly fine in the bedtime routine, lay down in his bed and say, I'm thirsty. I was like, oh, what kind, of, what kind of mom am I to say, no, you can't have water. Um, so I started to implement last sip. So before we go upstairs, I say, okay, it's time for a last sip. If you need some water now, it's the time to get it. So I could kind of identify what are these common stalling techniques and then implement them into the routine. If you know they're going to ask to go to the bathroom again, make sure they go to the bathroom two times before they get into their bed. So any of those common stalling techniques, just make sure to address them beforehand so when it does come up later, you can say, oh, we already, remember, we already did that. Now we're not going to have any more water until morning. We're not going to have any more snacks until morning, whatever it may be. So you don't feel bad as a parent denying them whatever it may be that they're asking, but you've built it in. Give me one last super big squeezy hug before you lay down into bed, because they're going to test all those boundaries and figure out like, what is that thing? that I can ask for that will get me out of bed or that will lengthen the routine. Um, the, the bathroom is the biggest one because no one's going to risk pee sheet. You're just right. I'm, I'm currently in the perfect storm of bathroom. I just want to give you a hug and can I have a water and then like a random, what's your favorite vehicle question? Yes. <laughs> we're, we're experiencing all of that. So thank you yes. for that. Um, <laughs> and now skewing a little bit younger of a lot of common themes of um, I'm nursing to go to sleep or they they'll go back to sleep with nursing. How do I, how do I separate that and allow them to fall asleep independently? I know we're probably getting into staying asleep with that question, but a little bit. Yeah, but definitely it applies because you do need to set that foundation of you're falling asleep independently at bedtime, because whatever happens at bedtime is going to be what they need overnight. If you wake up, if you fall asleep in your bed and you wake up in your kitchen, you had your sound machine on, your blanket, your pillow, all those good things. You wake up in your kitchen, you don't have any of those things. Maybe you can get yourself back to sleep, but it's gonna be a lot harder to do on your hard kitchen floor than it would be to be in your nice cozy soft bed with your pillow and blanket. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're trying to separate that feed and that sleep. So having something in between like a book, a song, you want to, if they're four months or older, you really want to have them um, 
falling like awake when they go into the crib drowsy but awake I'm gonna tell you don't even try to do that it is this big myth that families take forever to try to find and it doesn't exist at this stage so if you're trying to find that perfect balance of like how can I get you drowsy but awake into the crib don't do it because you're it's gonna be a lot of heartache trying to find that piece and I, I'm sure we'll touch a little bit on this in the the um staying asleep but I think um, transitions. So let's say we were on vacation and we are are just our, our whole life has been upheld. Now we have to get back into routine or I, a child's been sick or we've had grandma visit. Um, what is your what's your method of like getting back on track? So it a little bit depends on, on what the situation is. If you're away, children are really good about knowing, OK, in this location, these might be the rules, but at home, these are the rules. So if you're away and you're coming back, then just hopping right back on track, having the exact same expectations, they will be able to go back to, you know, whatever progress they were making or whatever great sleep they were doing. Um, I would always have bedtime be kind of a non-negotiable, whether you're away, someone is at your house, whatever it may be, because that's kind of the anchor of, of what everything else depends on. Naps can be flexible. They can be on the go. They can be they can be moved, but you really want that bedtime because that's going to set the stage for the whole next day. It's not really the morning that sets it, it's really the bedtime. Um, so if you, if you need to get back on track, like yes, your everything else falls apart for the day, get back on track at bedtime. Thank you. That kind of answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also <laughs> there, there's probably like preparing, preparing for, I know when my child's been sick, you, you, I have certainly altered what I've done to take care of him. So maybe rocking or, or mm -hmm. even sleeping with him. And then the getting back to the routine is tough because you've allowed exceptions. And so yes, a stumbling block of three or four per week. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's really hard, especially with illness, because you like when they're better is when you're going to go back to your old routine. But especially like my son has had a runny nose for, I don't know, four months and like the coughs that can linger forever. So it's like, when is that determining factor of like when they're better and when you should change things back? So I would try to keep things as similar as you possibly can, because when they're sick, if they've been used to sleeping in their bed independently, that's where they're going to sleep best. When you're sick, you want to be in the place that you know best. Um, so trying to keep everything as similar as you can and just change little things, maybe you sleep on their floor when they're not feeling well and you want to monitor them instead of bringing them into your room or into your bed. So that way, like you're close, you can watch out for them, make sure that they're okay, but they're still, their environment is staying the same. That's a good point. It's kind of flipping, flipping what you might naturally do and, and leaving their routine as much as possible. I like that. Oh, Give us some help here with the staying asleep. I know yeah. we've got a, a lot of people out there where the night wakes are are strong with this. Group. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody wakes up at night. You're never not going to wake up at night. But if you have great independent sleep skills, you can roll over, fluff your pillow, adjust your blanket, you're back to sleep. Your little one may not have those skills to do that yet. So again, that going to sleep is going to have a huge impact on being able to stay asleep. Um, the monitor, <laughs> I love baby monitors. We have them, we use them. Um, but if you have it, the volume it turned all the way up and it's like right next to your head, as soon as your child makes a noise, you're going to be alerted to that. And you're going to want to jump in right away. So try not to be too dependent on the monitor. Um, turn it, the volume down, place it on the other side of the bed, you know, whatever it may be, because we want to give them some time and some space to be able to figure this out on their own, where if automatically we're jumping in every time they make a peep, maybe they weren't even awake. Um, maybe they could have figured it out if we gave them another minute or two to do it. So really just make sure that you are giving some time before you even go in just to see like, can you figure this out on your own? Because running in too shows them like, you're not able to do this. I need to do this for you. 
where we wanted, we wanted to shift to, I have confidence that you are able to get yourself back to sleep. So this is going to come like once you're making some changes and they're falling asleep more independently at bedtime, that's when you want to like really give them a couple of minutes. And to me, I mean, I would give them at least depending on their age, if they're younger than three months, I would give them three minutes. If they're older than three months, I would give them between five and 10 minutes before you go in and provide some support. Um, using the sound machine, night lights, and blackout shades will definitely help, especially the blackout shades with summer coming. Um, it's going to get bright early and it's going to stay bright later. So especially your older, like four or five-year-olds, they're going to say, I'm not tired. The sun's still up. I shouldn't have to go to bed. It's still light out. Um, so it's really, that's, Go, you're going to want to make that environment of like, look, it's dark. It's time to go to sleep because melatonin levels um, have a little bit of not trouble, but um, it's a little bit harder for them to rise when it is super bright. So even um, back to the bedtime routine, like dimming the lights in your house, if you're noticing that your child is having trouble unwinding will help. Um, if you do have to initially go, if you do have to go in while your child um, is having some trouble overnight, you want to try to leave before they fall back to sleep. And that's, again, you want them to be able to fall asleep independently where they're not falling asleep with you in the room. They wake up without you in the room. They're going to panic and be looking for you again. So, can, can, yeah. Can I pa pause for a moment? I love the, the comment that um, one of our parents, Lindsay's just, just wrote in, can now open the door. And I always think of Jurassic Park when the velociraptors have like, have figured out how to open the door handle. And I think Whoa. of like, oh my God, my child's <laughs> figured it out. We, we've got a couple common issues of not just, not just waking up, but now they have the ability to leave. Or I think one, one parent mentioned like they go exploring. So maybe they're in the mm. closet or they come out and, you know, they're not in their bed. Um, how how have you approached this in the past? Any advice? Yes. So there's going to be a couple of things. So I would definitely kind of like clear the room. If you know, um, if there's a lot of toys in there, a lot of things in there, you want to try to put as much away as you can. So again, setting that environment where I'm not going to put you to bed in this super fun room. Um, judge it. Are they getting up and maybe walking around, but they're quiet. They're kind of like doing their own thing, hanging out, not doing anything dangerous. Maybe we can leave it for a little bit longer. I've had children that have fallen asleep on the floor, fallen asleep next to the bed, not on the bed. That's okay. As long as they're doing it independently, um, they will be able to sleep in their own bed, but maybe like as they're figuring it out, they're getting up to explore a little bit. If they are leaving the room, then that's definitely, um, you might want to put like a gate or something up just because you don't want them to be going if you're asleep into any other areas of the house that, that might not be safe. Um, if, so there's going to be a piece of like consequences and rewards. So at the older ages, when they have, are in a bed and can just get up and walk out, you need to give them some incentive of why they need to stay in bed. What's going to happen that they're looking forward to that's going to keep them in bed. But there also needs to be this other side of this consequence of if you're not staying in bed, then this will happen. So that is pretty individualized because I, it depends on the child and the age and all of that. Um, but just know like having a consequence, but also having a reward that will happen right in the morning. Sticker charts that add up aren't, aren't going to work. Um, because they need that immediate gratification. You can do that in addition, but you also are going to need something that's happening right when they wake up. As you did it, here you go. Whether they're not going to know, like you have to have five stickers by Friday. They're not going to remember on Friday that on Tuesday they didn't do it and be upset that they didn't get the prize on Friday because they did it Thursday night into Friday. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then for early mornings too, anything before an hour before your desired wake up, treat that as a night waking. So if you want your child to wake up closer to seven and they're getting up at five, it's definitely still a night waking, do the same things, get them back to sleep at that time. And the goal, I, the goal is, the goal is sleep for sure, but the goal is also quiet, independent in their room, right? Yes. So that's still going to count as rest. So for older children, like two and a half and up, 
you can use something like a hatch light or um, a toddler clock, okay, the wake clock, even just a, um, a digital clock with the minutes covered that just shows the hours, something like that. So they have a very concrete mm -hmm. example of when can I get up? When can I leave the room? Um, if it's a younger child and they're just like hanging out, rolling around, babbling to themselves, perfect. Nobody opens their eyes and like jumps out of bed. You want that like nice ease into the day. So if you want to help facilitate that, um, like you can just be in here and relax and be comfortable and you're okay and safe. Thank you. I know we've got a lot of questions that will probably um, be related to that, but I want to keep going on um, so we can come back. And we, we do have a lot of uh, really good crib questions that we've saved for mm -hmm. the, the last slide too. So. Um, so last one is nightmares versus night terrors. So this is going to come, it could come at any age, um, usually around that two plus, like one's imagination starts a little bit more. Um, so nightmares are going to be your child wakes up, they're scared, they are upset, they are unhappy, they know, they can remember what happened, but they may not be able to articulate to you what that dream was about. Um, it's best if this happens to console them, to help calm them, um, put them back into their bed, and then help them drift back off to sleep. Um, the nightmares the, to prevent them, I mean, you want to just be aware of what they're watching during the day, what they're talking about, what they're seeing. Um, and then if you do have any like potential things that you notice, talk to them about it during the day. So say your child has a nightmare tonight. Tomorrow, you can bring it up. Hey, I know that you were scared overnight. What happened? Do you remember what you dreamed about? Um, you can do it in like a play situation. So have cars or dolls or little people to act that out because they're probably not going to be able to tell you what happened when they're super upset in the moment, but then they'll be able to in a safer environment when they're not as like in their feelings, they can be able to talk about it a little bit more. So then you can understand, oh, maybe they were watching this and they didn't even realize that that could be scary to them or they saw this at school or at tv or um a friend told them about it that's you know that's kind of what to what to pinpoint and get to the root of for a night terror this is way different because they're not going to know what ha what is happening you're going to go in there they could be screaming they could be crying they could be kicking but they're actually not awake so it's going to be a lot harder to soothe them because they're super upset, but they're still deep into sleep. So once you, you want to, if that's happening, like gently rouse them, lay them down, give them a nice tight squeeze. Um, and then they should be able to like, they'll wake up and like, why are you here? What are you doing? I, what was happening? Um, so then you should be able to get them back to sleep fairly easily because they were still asleep. Um, Night terrors usually come because children are not getting the amount of sleep that they need, whether it be overnight or during the day. So really looking at how much sleep are they getting? What's the quality of their sleep? You could see night terrors in children um, that commonly snore or um, breathe through their, like breathe through their mouths because um, it's a beginning sign of sleep apnea. So if your child maybe is getting enough sleep, but the quality of sleep isn't there, that could be leading to some night terrors as well. So um, for this, the biggest takeaway, just control what you can control, kind of watch what they're looking, watch what they're looking at, um, be sure that they're getting enough sleep that's appropriate for their age, and that should help to combat those two. Um, there was a specific question about night terrors. Um, if you don't mind um, taking a look at that before we move on, because I know that was a very specific question that just jumped in. Was um, it just this? Uh, the eight months um, more frequently. Like still, should we try to still wake in this situation with illness and congestion and where crying makes it worse? Like the, the answer is yes, wake, try to wake them or console them regardless, right? Of the age and the worse. condition. Oh, yes. Um, I mean, because usually around 30 plus minutes and crying makes it worse for congestion. Yeah, you're not going to be able to not have them cry because how do I say this you can't prevent them from crying during that time it would just be a console situation um because they're not awake 
So you would try to just console them and rouse them gently as best you can, which hopefully will then um, help. But with the illness, like maybe they're not getting the quality of sleep that they need. Maybe they need more sleep because they're not feeling well. So um, it would, yeah, it's just monitoring, getting them the sleep that they need, helping them through it in the moment and helping them back to sleep. But that's really, um, try to gently awake them. But it kind of, and I don't yeah. want to say it is what it is, but it's tough. Yeah. Being, being with a sick kid and, and worrying about sleep in general is a tough one too. Yeah. Well, let's, let's move on to, oops, a couple things about introduction of certain items, certain ages. You know, we've got yeah. a lot of ideas about beds and cribs and yeah. <laughs> mentioned clocks. Um, yeah, I'm going to start the, I mean, the bed. Oh, I'll talk about that. I have a lot of thoughts about beds. Um, so a sleep sack. So you initially are swaddling until about 12 weeks old. Um, you want to start that tra swaddle transition somewhere between eight and 10 weeks. So they are fully out of the swaddle by 12 weeks. That is a lot earlier than probably some of you have heard. Um, but they've changed the recommendation because a lot of um, infants are doing like accidental rolling. So we want to make sure that the first time that they're rolling is not when you were asleep and when they are asleep. Um, so now it's recommended to have them out of the swaddle by 12 weeks. Um, introducing a blanket and or a lovey um, somewhere around 12 months, definitely nothing else in the crib with them until they are at least 12 months old. And then I would start very small with like a small, like a breathable blanket um, and a very small lovey until you're very comfortable with that. Um, a pillow can happen. You can add it into the crib after a child is 18 months old, but really I recommend waiting until they're moving into a toddler bed to introduce a pillow. Um, but that's after 18 months, it's a personal choice. A toddler clock. Um, so that would be, like I mentioned, the hatch, um, the okay to wait clock, a digital clock, something like that. You can start to introduce at two and a half. Um, they may not fully understand like this light turning means that I can now get out of bed, but having that and introducing them to that. So when they are ready, they, they're going to have a really concrete example of when they can get out of their bed. So when they do move to a toddler bed, it's not a big change of like, I have to understand what this clock does. And I have to know that I can stay, I have to stay in this invisible boundary of my bed. Like they're already used to the clock. They already know what the function is. They can easily follow it. Um, the transition to a toddler bed, I should say never. <laughs> Push it out as long as you possibly can. Keep them in a crib because again, at least two and a half because it's really hard for a two-year-old to understand this is my bed and this is where I should stay when like, look at all this other space. I can easily just put my feet on the floor and walk out. So waiting until they are developmentally at an age where they can understand why like they need to stay in this small space is going to be really helpful for you and for that transition. So ideally after the age of three is when you want to wait. Um, I know a lot of parents will say like their children are crawling out of the crib. Um, and that's like, I could go for an hour just on that. Um, but you want to try all of the things before you move them to a bed. I wouldn't the first time they swing their leg over say, oh, they're ready. I would put them back into a sleep sack, turn the sleep sack sideways, move the mattress all the way down to the bottom, um, to the floor. If the crib is taller on one side, turn that crib around so the taller side is on the outside. So there's a lot of things that I would recommend doing before moving them to a bed. You want that transition to a bed to be, they are sleeping amazing in their crib. They're getting a little bit big for their crib. Now we're gonna move them to a bed. You don't want it to be, they're not sleeping well in the crib maybe this bed will be enough, like the magic cure. It won't, sorry. <laughs> it's just gonna make it harder. Thank you. Um, as just one question as we're thinking about the bed and then um, Emily, I, I know you've been checking out questions too. If you could help us, we can start going right into the Q and A. Um, for toddlers uh, in bed and, and thinking about napping, um, if they are like the the idea of getting out for naps too are you are you also using the same method where you would for the nighttime or is a nap different when it comes to getting out of bed and are you staying at the doorway are you are you using that same advice 
Yeah. So really every single sleep situation, you want to be the same because it's confusing if there's one rule for bedtime, there's one rule for a nap. So really like as consistent as you can be across the board, that's going to be helpful. Um, and yeah, if you can, like we have the hatch, I use the hatch at nap time too. So it, once the sound machine, we don't use the light, but once the sound machine comes on, that's my uh, two-year-old signal. Oh, it's time for me to go into my bed. Once the sound machine turns off, you know, he stands right up and says, like, okay, now it's time to come out. So using things like that, it's really, it takes away that power struggle. It's not like mom, dad, grandma, caregiver, or telling me that I have to stay in my bed. It's like, nope, it's the light. The light is the one that is telling me to stay in the bed. And it really like, it works. Children are like, oh, the light. Yeah, you're right. Um, so yeah, as consistent as you can be, whatever strategies you were using at bedtime, you should be using overnight. You should be using for naps. Thank you. And um, I think we've solidly gone into questions. Emily, are there, is there anything that I haven't seen yet that you've been noticing? Um, I know there, there were questions about regressions. Um, yeah, I, and I, read I know that a bunch. Uh, do, can we get out of the screen share? Oh yes, of course. I know you love that. Mm -hmm. Hold on one moment. There we okay. go. Better. Great. Here, I will add myself so I'm not a weird voice coming in from the background. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Shinsine. That was so helpful. Yeah. Um, let's see. I wrote down a bunch of questions as they were coming in. I know we talked a lot about, you know, big kid bed and won't stay in it. Um, one question I don't think we answered yet, and I did have to troubleshoot some attendees in the middle, so if I missed anything, I'm sorry about that. Um, how can you get a kid to stay asleep without their pacifier at the age where they're really outgrowing it, but use it as a comfort item? Hmm. Yes. So there's like a, there's a window. So in the very beginning, like under four months, the pacifier, uh, before one, like before one, great for like since prevention, but um, there is a little window in the beginning where they're not able to put it in themselves. So that definitely is a tricky stage. But then on the other end of it, when, you know, you're ready to wean it. So I generally recommend weaning like kind of when you're moving to a bed, like that two, two and a half, um, because then they're going to be able to understand a little bit more. So you can, you have a couple of options. You can just like cold turkey, take it away and just, they're not offered anymore. Um, you can do something like the Binky Fairy or um, like where there's a whole story, you you leave it like under your pillow or you leave it somewhere and then the Binky Fairy replaces it with a gift. Um, for us, we I had brought my son to build a bear and we put all of his into a bear and then that became his new comfort item. He actually never slept with it. He was, he was like, this isn't the thing, but he liked to have it on his dresser and to look at it. So you want to make sure that there is some other item of comfort that can be presented. So if they have a pacifier and a lovey, make sure that lovey is still very readily available. Um, you can like, maybe there's a new baby in your family. You can tell them that they're going to give it to the new baby. People have put them like tied it to a balloon and had it sail away. Um, whatever it is, but something that's like, have them be a part of it. I don't really love the cold turkey because it feels, it's hard of just like, where is it? Why is it not here? But if you make them a part of it, then it really can be a smoother transition. But again, making sure that they can transition that into some other comfort item. I've seen right. what someone yeah, has gone to the dentist and they've given it to the mm -hmm. dentist during the checkup as like, here you go. I'm a big kid yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, I know you talked about, you know, if a kid is afraid of the dark after age two, you could introduce a nightlight. Um, what if it's that they're like sort of afraid of being alone in their room? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's very common and pretty tricky. So, um, it, it's going to be a lot of talking them through. So for, in this case, I would do, um, like you can let them know where you're going to be. I'm, you know, you're going to be sleeping in your bed. I'm going to be in my room. I'm going to be in the living room just so they have like a sense of kind of where everybody is and what's happening. So it's not just like I'm in this room alone. Who knows where everybody else is? You can do some play, play around it, um, like cars, dolls, little people. Um, okay, I'm going to put you into your bed. Now I'm going to go do this and that. So it's really just going to be having them like, giving them the information first off and then helping them feel comfortable and safe in their room. So it's not 
like a punishment or a scary thing that they have to be in their room alone. And Jen Zine, are you doing that to jump on this too? Are you doing that in the daytime when yes. it's, it's a moment, not right before bed? And not in, yes, not in the moment where like they're feeling that anxiety and scared of it when they're completely removed from it. Mm -hmm. You. you also said you said something at our last session that I loved where you were like, turn the lights off in your your child's room, mm -hmm. see what it looks like from their perspective. Like, is there a shadow that you might never notice that they see? Or does that light look different in the yeah. in the nighttime? And so trying to put their, yourself in their shoes and, and maybe finding that it's it's really the makeup of the room, too. Yeah. Yeah. Is there like wherever the nightlight is, is it shining? Like you have a chair with like laundry on it and you're like, okay, yeah, that looks a little bit scary in the, at night or, you know, something like that, whatever it may be. Definitely just laying down, taking a survey of the room. Um, we didn't even talk about like monsters and things like that. So I'm not going to go into it, but um, okay. I won't go into it. I, my son has actually been saying that he's two and he'll say, there's a monster in my crib. And, you know, I started asking more questions about the monster mm -hmm. and like, well, it, maybe it's a friendly monster. Did you say hello to it? You know? And so now he talks about how it's a friendly monster and he said, hello. And it's a funny mm -hmm. monster. And, you know, the monster just wanted to sleep in his crib. Like we sort of did like a whole thing around it mm -hmm. and it seemed to work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's another question about, um, if, um, you have been co-sleeping, um, mm -hmm. how to transition a child out of your bed. Good, good one. Yes. Um, so it's going to depend on the age of the child. Was there an age listed? I want to, uh, I have to scroll back, but I think maybe it was like okay. two or three. Okay. I know we've had, we've had some older ones from the, the, the yeah, there we, two. we okay. have an older one too. So maybe two and up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the first thing, um, you're really going to want to be clear about is this is this a transition that you want to make because any changes like they have had two plus years of sleeping in this one place so when you make that change just know it's it's going to be a difficult change for them because that's that could be the only bed that they've ever known so with that said um is totally possible and i help families with this all the time um but it's going to be about like here is your new space here is here is where you sleep. This is where you sleep to rest your body and to get your energy to be able to play tomorrow. This is where I sleep to be able to, you know, rest my body and be able to be the best mommy, daddy, or grandma, or whoever I can be. Um, you're going to do, like, if you have a bedtime routine established, you're going to do that same routine, but it's just going to come in their room instead of yours. If you don't have a solid bedtime routine established, then you're going to want to do that one with the new expectation that, like, this is now where you sleep. It's going to be a little bit rough in the beginning of if they're in a bed, like returning them to their bed multiple times because they're just so used to sleeping in this, this environment that you need to like kind of nurture that and show them how comfortable it can be. Give them choices, help them be a part of that. So they get to pick up their sheets, their blankets, what lovey they get to sleep with, what pajamas they get to wear. Um, really just empowering them to, and showing them like, I have the confidence in you to sleep in this place. It is new, yes, but it's wonderful. Look at all the like, you know, look at your new space that you have. So it's definitely going to be an adjustment again, but not one that's, if you want to make that change, it's not one that's like not worth making. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess probably definitely be prepared for tears and for an upset child and, just, and yeah, so mentally prepare that as a parent. Exactly. Yeah. Just some push up because again, it's been two years of, of the same thing. So then it's, yes, you could prepare. And if we were working together, we would have a plan and we would have talked it out and you'll be feeling good about it. But to them, it's kind of one random night that these changes happen. So just taking that into account and knowing like whatever behavior or pushback that they're exhibiting, again, it's not like personal like it's not like they're not going to love you anymore or anything like that but maybe the reward is they get to come into your bed and snuggle in the morning not with the expectation of sleep but just like now this is our special cuddle time together not overnight when we're sleeping mm -hmm. would you say the same thing kind of applies throughout some of these challenges where co-sleeping is definitely a big adjustment from a lifestyle perspective but leaving a room or not made up motivated by rewards or I've been sleeping with them and getting them to fall asleep. Would you, would you say foundationally a lot of the same things would apply as like 
making a plan, talking it out, and then also assuming there's going to be some yes. an upset child and kind of planning for that as well. Exactly. Exactly. I feel like that's the case with like everything that I try to change, like, oh, yeah. you bring too much screen time during the pandemic. So I had to make rules. And there were a lot of a lot of tantrums and tears the first couple of weeks, but I just, you know, stick with it, yeah. stay consistent, and then they move past it. And so, then that's the new normal. Yeah. yeah. So and it's hard, like, I think, for us as parents, it's like we're uncomfortable with those feelings of our child being upset and we want to mm-hmm. just like make it stop. But then, you know, that's a slippery slope of just giving into way too much and yeah, it's and hard. We're, 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 we're not teaching them the, the independence lessons that they need to be able to thrive later as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, we have five minutes left and several more really good questions. We'll see how many we can get through. I'll see how fast I can talk. Okay. One <laughs> question is um, if um, two parents have like different bedtime routines or get the kids to bed at different times, like whether you know, it's in the same household, just taking turns on different nights or the parents are separated or divorced. Um, you know, how do you, how do you kind of navigate that? Yeah. So that, I mean, back to exactly what Gretchen was saying, like just having a foundation, you want to try to replicate it as best you can, but sometimes like maybe someone lives a little bit further away from childcare than the other one. So it's just like, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, I would try to have the bedtimes within a half an hour of each other. So if at one place they're going to bed at seven or one night they're going to bed at seven, they can be in bed at about 7.30 the next. Um, having the same routine, maybe like the nuances of, nuances of it are different. You're reading different books. You're doing it in a different location, but kind of the foundation of it is the same. Um, but really like trying to have the basis, like the bones of it be similar so they know that okay this is um th- these things mean that sleep is coming even if it's a little bit different at each point mm-hmm. thank you um you know speaking of you said like maybe one parent lives further from daycare that kind of transitions into another good question which is you know if you are a full-time working parent your kid is in a full-time daycare program you really can only get them home at a certain time you're starting dinner like it's you know, maybe dinner takes a long time because sometimes mm-hmm. they eat so very slowly. Yeah. <laughs> are extra hungry that day and keep asking for more. Um, you know, do you have any advice around that? Because I know sometimes I struggle with that. It's like, I'm, you know, I'm pretty strict on bedtime. I'm trying to get my kids to bed at a certain time, but you know, sometimes the schedule is tight. Yeah. And you, you don't want it to like, you want that time to be an unwind time. You don't want it to be this like frantic, like get on your jammies, brush your teeth. And like, just as mad dash to get them in because that's certainly not relaxing. Um, So see where those adjustments can be made. Maybe daycare is far enough away that they can get a little cat nap in on the way home so that they can have a little bit of a later bedtime. Do you have any adjustment like on the, the back end in the morning? Can you put them to bed a little bit later so you can spend some time with them in the morning and then, um, like, but they can sleep a little bit later in the morning. You want to have all of the ages that I've been listed. You still want to have a solid 12 hours overnight. Maybe they're not sleeping that full time, but you want to have it offered. Um, so seeing like, how can we tweak our, our schedule to have the sleep, have the opportunities for sleep that are needed. Um, but it's hard. That definitely, definitely is a factor in things. And, um, some kids are just on the lesser end of sleep needs. So maybe it works for them, but if not, and your child is feeling constantly overtired, like where can we add in some more sleep or make up for that sleep? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, my daughter, there's no, maybe she can sleep later. It's like, no matter what time she goes to bed at night, she is up by 6am sharp, like (laughs) earlier. Um, It's so fun. Yeah. It's like their body clocks are just so strong. Yeah. Bing, 6 a.m. Like the very bottom end of the sleep ranges yeah. for every age. So, you know, <laughs> she's yeah, and somebody else going with it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see. So, this, I feel like um, we need to do a whole session on this, but two kids sharing a room. Gretchen will talk about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Session. Um, I know this is so common, you know, in cities mm-hmm. like New York, where it's like many families, like you can only have a two bedroom and your kids have yeah. to share a room. There's no other option, but one kid goes to bed earlier or later or wakes the other one mm-hmm. up or, you know, it's hard for the other one to fall back to sleep. Maybe they're coming into your room. I mean, there's so many different scenarios, but I guess, do you just have any like top, you know, two or three tips for um, helping kids share a room? Better? Yeah. 
So my boys share a room. So this is definitely something that I have lots of experience with. Um, so having them do, depending on the ages, if you can do the bedtime routines together, that's going to, that's going to be the biggest thing for your buck. So we brush, they both brush their teeth. We both do the jammies. We both do books and then everyone goes to bed. So there's no, like this one is staying up later than this one. This one is having to creep in. It, it works. So if they're of similar ages and you can do a similar bedtime, that is the biggest thing that I would recommend. If not, then having having a plan of like, okay, jammies and everything out for this child doing their routine and then having them quietly slip in. Um, and then just the expectations are the same, that same like consequence and reward um, for us. Like, yes, I'm a sleep consultant. Yes, my kids sleep amazing, but they're children. They're not robots, you know? So even last night, my older son came out and said, Joanne's waking me up. And he said, okay, let's go back in. So I went back in. I reminded my younger son of the rules. He was just like singing a song about Blippi, I think, Blippi Garbage Truck. Um, yes, song. Yes. I get it. <laughs> I, get it. I wake up with um, it. <laughs> so he was just singing that, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't trying to be disruptive. He wasn't trying to wake his brother, but I just had to remind him, you know, it's time for sleep. I know you're, you love that song. We can sing that song together in the morning. If you continue to sing that song, then, you know, this may happen, but then he just went to bed. My older son went to bed and it worked out. So the logistics of it are definitely a little bit trickier. If you can't have like a partition or angle it so they can't directly see each other, that will be helpful too. Um, but you're right there. This could be like a whole hour talk on sibling sharing a room because yeah. there is so many things like the ages and what kind of beds they're in and all of that really does play a factor. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I know we're at time. Um, so we probably have to wrap things up, but, um, you know, I, I think, um, Jen scene is available for virtual consultations anywhere. Yeah. Right. And, um, yeah, one-on-one -on -one help. So I know so many sleep needs and issues are very individual and personalized. And so it can, you know, if you are struggling, it can really help to talk to, um, a specialist and even just set up like a couple sessions. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And quickly before we leave, I just want to um, first say that we have a winner from our giveaway. It's Liz Walton Egan. I don't think she's on anymore. She might have been on, but I saw her name just a minute ago. So Liz Walton Egan, we will be excited to uh, reach out to you and, and give you a little bit of Lewis love. And mm -hmm. um, Jen Z and Emily, it's um, always amazing to have both of you. Um, I already have a couple of things I know I'm going to try to put into place <laughs> for next time for, for tonight, for, for better sleep for all of us. Great. Thank you so much. As always, yes, um, this session was so helpful. Um, Jen Steen, you have such amazing tips. Um, I, my son is, um, he'll be two and a half at the end of next month. And I'm starting to think about that transition to a toddler bed being like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> my two year old, he climbed out of his crib yesterday. I just heard uh, steps and I was yeah, like, like oh. Oh. Mine like has never tried. He really likes his crib. Um, I never did either. Wood. Yeah. And, and he even like sometimes wants to stay in there extra time in the morning. And I'm like, you sure you don't want to get out now? And he's like, no, I'm going to stay in my crib. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. We'll see. Let's hope that it's a smooth transition at that time. Um, but thank you again so much. It's so helpful. Um, the recording will be sent out to everybody in the follow-up email. Um, so if you missed anything or, um, you know, you just want to review again later, um, you'll have that opportunity. Um, so thanks. Have a great rest of your day and um, I will talk to you guys soon. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.